God's still there. God is still there. You're going to hear that several times here this morning. Thank you so very much. Thank you for that song, that message and song. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. I was a youth pastor in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was in uh, just finishing Bible college and uh, we had uh, all kinds of activities to try to attract teenagers. They like the more dangerous kinds of things, the more, you know, uh, drastic uh, kinds of things. And so we planned a rafting trip down the Nantahala River. And the Nantahala River is not, a, a, it's not like the, the Colorado River, you know, and, and that kind of thing, but it is challenging. It goes into a class four rapids at the end that they use for Olympic trials and things of that nature. But we were just in class two uh, rapids, uh, sometimes class three, in some of the worst uh, areas. Jason Harvey was a young, uh, just a young boy, uh, seventh grade. He wanted to go. He was the son of an old age couple. You know how it is, the only son that they had. And they were very protective of Jason. And he wanted to go so badly. And, and uh, he said, please come talk to my parents, talk to my parents, talk to my mom. I went to their house and I sat down with Mrs. Harvey. And I said, if you will let Jason go, I'll make sure that he's in my raft. And I will look after him. And uh, he'll have a good time and, and, and all of this. And she looked at me. She said, okay, all right. So we got all the young people and all the rafts. And, and uh, you know, it starts out very calm, you know, just the water's just very flat. And, and then you get into those rapids and it gets a little exciting. And Jason Harvey, he was having a blast. He was having a marvelous time. And uh, it was the most fun he'd ever had in his life until the time that he flipped out of the raft. And I, all I could see was Mrs. Harvey's face. <laughs> and so I jumped in after him. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, you know, he was wearing a life preserver, but, uh, but he, he, was, he didn't realize the danger that he was in, the rocks and all that kind of thing. Tragedy happens sometimes with those kinds of scenarios. Got him back in the raft and, and all that kind of thing. And boy, I was thinking, boy, this is awful. This was, this was bad. And I said, man, you put your feet up under that, th you know, and uh, hold on. And, you know, I, I, I didn't think it'd get much worse than that. And, uh, well, we, we got down to the end, of the end of the raft, end of the river there and the raft trip. Got all the young people out, out of the raft and on, onto the shore and, and uh, I, had, uh, I had gotten out to, to hold on to the, to push the raft uh, up close to the, the dock area that they had. And uh, some, somebody, uh, somehow, one of the, one of the larger guys kind of kicked the raft as he was getting out. And I lost my balance. And the current was very strong, very strong. And uh, so I go down that river headed for the class four rapids without a raft. And I thought, just when I thought it couldn't get any worse. It did. It did. And uh, I, I just had this thought in my mind. I thought, well, at least maybe I'll make the news. That would be a great thing. <laughs> Never been in the news. Just when you think life can't get any worse, many times it does. And some of you are going through some things in your life today, and you're thinking, it can't get worse. God Please don't sin anymore. I don't know if I can take it. And just when you think that it can't get any worse, sometimes it does. Mary, good to see you. Bless your heart. Glad you're here. Everything that they've been through, the Hipshins have, have, have been through with Caitlin, and then, and then uh, this week, uh, she tried to avoid uh, a wild driver that cut her off, and in so doing, she had, she had to swerve, and then she hit somebody and uh, got, got that word. And, and uh, good, to, good to see you. Glad for God's protective hand. Just when you think things can't get worse, it did. But when that happens, they remind you, God's still there. Could you say that with me? 
God's still there. First Kings chapter 17, let's begin reading please in verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink to the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Let's stop and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the music that has been reminding us that you are honored, you are glorified, you are exalted, and that, Lord, you're there. In the midst of our trials, in the midst of whatever's going on, we can go singing, I go, along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Lord, may you help us to follow your admonition. Paul wrote that these things in the Old Testament were written for our admonition as examples. And Lord, help us to learn to live as a child of the King. Lord, help us to realize that you are still there, that you are in control. And Lord Jesus, minister to our hearts here today, I pray. Holy Spirit, magnify our Lord and Savior, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. In this passage here, we find that there was a great spiritual dearth. There was starvation spiritually happening. If you, if you look over just a few verses earlier in chapter 16, verse 25, the Bible says, But Amri wrought evil in the, wor- in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. King Amri, this was Ahab's father. And he did worse than any of the kings before him. Skip down now to verse 30. The Bible says in, in chapter 16, And Ahab the son of Amri did evil inside the Lord above all that were before him. Look at verse 32. Um, excuse me, Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. So he outdid his father. What's some of the things that he did? Verse 32, he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. In his days did... uh, uh, Hiel, the, the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof uh, with his firstborn and the gates thereof with his youngest son, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. The cursed land of Jericho, Ahab authorized the rebuilding of this cursed land. The worship of Baal, groves, altars, the temple of Baal, He did more to anger God than anyone. In the midst of spiritual starvation, God is still there. He was raising up a man named Elijah. We have no knowledge of Elijah before this this time in 1 Kings 17. And God God always has a remnant. God always has someone. when, when, When you see this world turning their back on God, pushing God out of their life, pushing God out of our culture, pushing God out of our education and out of our families, and God's principles are no longer allowed, may I remind you that God's still there. He still has a remnant. In the midst of spiritual starvation, in the midst of physical need. Now, God told his prophet Elijah said go hide now he told King Ahab what God told him to say you would think that everything would be fine when you obey God and you do what God tells you to do and you and and you witness and you and you're you're striving to be a bold testimony you're trying to love on people and you're trying to do what is right you would think that things would all work out well he was a Israel's most wanted God told him, go hide. Now, normally, you would think that God's people would be on top all the time. Sometimes we have to hide under the wing and protection of our Lord and Savior. Sometimes we have to pull aside because God is doing something greater than we can ever imagine. Families, God is always at work in your home, in your family, in your life. God is always shaping and molding you. And he's even shaping and molding Elijah. 
The servant of God, he's working on him. Let's read, please, in verse number 6 in 17, 1 Kings 17. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Amazon thought that they had something new when they had drones delivering boxes to people. God had them beat a long time ago. And I don't know what the bread and flesh was. I don't, I don't know if it was turkey sandwiches. I don't know if, uh, what exactly it was, but bread and flesh. And by the way, God also in so doing, he fed the ravens. God always takes care of those who do his work. God, you'll see that in this, in this passage here. Verse number 7, it came to pass after a while, after a while, that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. What do you do when the brook dries up? What do you do when what God has told you to do no longer seems to work? You say, well, that would never happen. You haven't served God very long, have you? <laughs> it seems like the doors close. It seems like that, that uh, you're, you're, you're kind of hitting the ceiling. You're saying, God, what are you doing? God knows what he is doing. We can always trust in him. The brook dried up and God had a plan. Verse number 8 says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, let's get the picture here. Uh, God used delivery birds, and now God's using a precious widow. God uses unusual circumstances to take care of his work, to take care of his plan. Unusual circumstances. That's just the creativity of Almighty God. We try to figure God out. We try to help God out. We try to plan things out. And we say, God, it seems to me like this would be the right thing to do. But our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. And God uses unusual means. Verse, uh, verse number 10, the Bible says, So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the, wom the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Yet remember, he is parched. He is thirsty. Don't know how long it's been since he's had some water. And he asks, he asks the lady kindly and courteously, Where's some water? Could you get me just a cup of water, please? And the Bible says in verse 11, and as she was going to fetch it, notice that she didn't say, well, who are you? Well, I've never seen you before, or, or are you talking to me? Is this my job, you know? As she's going to fetch it, he called to her and said, uh, also, bring me, a, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Just a, do you have a little biscuit? I haven't eaten today. Maybe it's been a couple of days. How about a little biscuit? Do you have something? Verse 12, and she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. I'm going to make a fire. I've just gone after a little kindling. I'm going to make a little fire, and, and the only thing that I have left at the bottom of the barrel the only thing I have left is just a little bit of meal. I'm going to make a little biscuit, a little, little piece of bread for my son and I. And that's all that we have left. And then we're going to die. She was looking at death all around her. Other people were starving to death around her. She had no one to provide for her. Her husband was gone. She had done everything she could do. She had stretched the dollar, so to speak, as far as it would go. And this was it. And it was over. And she was honest, and she said, I, I, I don't have any bread. In essence, I would give it to you if I did. I'm just going to go make this little biscuit for my, my son and I, and then we're going to die. Verse 13, Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Two good words in, in the Bible. Fear not. That's a good Bible study, by the way. If you have a concordance and can, and can look... Look up the word fear. Look at all the times that God says, fear not. Fear not, he said. Go and do as thou hast said. 
But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Boy, that's a good statement. We need to hear, thus saith the Lord. We need to have God's direction in our life. We need to have God's wisdom and rely upon Him and what He says. Thus saith the Lord. We can bank on that. The Bible says, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. God will take care of you, He said. You do what I'm saying, and God will take care of you. This bold belief at the bottom of the barrel. Bold belief at the bottom of the barrel. We see first in that she obeyed God's promise. God made a promise. God always keeps his promises. I'm so thankful for that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm so thankful that God always keeps his promises. I have been young and now I'm old. And I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God will not turn away from his children. The Bible tells us here in, in verse uh, number 15, I want you to see something here. Verse 15, and she went and did. Look at verse 5 in our, in our chapter there. Verse 5 says, so he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. Verse 15 and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. You know, a lot of times we think about doing the right thing. We think about obeying the Lord. We think about getting saved. We think about joining a church. We think about following the Lord in believers' baptism. We think about going on visitation. We think about picking up some tracks on the way out. We think about giving. We think about doing something for God with our talent that we have. We think about it, and we aim to, but we don't. Don't ever do it. He went and did. She went and did. And God blessed that. God blessed it. It's an act of our will. That's a great, great thing. She obeyed God's promise. Uh, she, she recognized the presence of God. You know our problem? We, we are so consumed with the entertainment world. We're so consumed with chasing the dollar, paying our bills. We're so consumed with the needs of our own life that we somehow forget that God is still there. We somehow forget His presence. He is everywhere. He wants to be involved in every part of our life. And not to take things from us, but to give things to us and through us. He was going to bless this widow lady as she blessed God's work and God's plan. God always gives with a greater shovel than we can ever dig and give back to him. She obeyed God's promise with the presence of God in her heart and the priority of God arranged in her life. She said, do this first. In Sunday school, Brother Randy Taylor was, was teaching on, on a lot of these same kinds of things and the priorities of following God. Matthew 6, says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, Lord, if, if I have time, I'll serve you this week. If I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll come out, and if there's a need you know, at the church, I'll, I, if it works out, I'll, I'll do that. Lord, if, if I have enough to pay my bills, then, then I'll tithe. But you understand, if I don't have enough, then I don't have enough. Here's the lady who said, this is my last meal, and I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to obey God's word. And I'm, I'm hearing that there's a promise attached, and I'm going to believe that. He said, Go and make this first, and God will take care of you. There's a great song about that, about God taking care of us. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is still in the Bible. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Are all things good? When the brook dried up, was that good? No. But it worked together for good. He met the widow of Zarephath. When her meal was running out, was that good? No. But it worked together for good because it connected her with God's man and God's power and God's promise. And she got in on God's blessing. She obeyed God's promise and she received God's provision. Now, 
we oftentimes want God's provision first. Lord, if you'll do this, then I will do that. Our statement up here says, just live by what? Faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So sometimes, like, like, uh, like Abraham of old, God tells Abraham, you go into a land that I will show thee of. I will lead you step by step. I will guide you. Corey Ten Boom said this, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to an all-knowing God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to an all-knowing God. She learned this. This widow of Zarephath. Well, the Bible says in verse 15 again, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. Every day's a banquet, and every what? Every meal's a feast. Tom Taylor always says that. Every day is a holiday or something like that. And, and uh, Verse 16, the Bible says, The barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Woo! Amen for God's blessing. Thank God for the, the way that God can, can move every single time. They, they scrape the, the bottom of the barrel, and the next day they go back to the barrel, and there's just enough again. And the next day, just enough again. That's the way God directs. That's the way God loves to provide for his people. He sent manna from heaven to the children of Israel in the wilderness. How much? Enough for that day. Enough for that day. His provision requires daily faith. Daily faith. Lord, I'm here again to serve you this morning. Thank you so very much for everything you did yesterday. I'm depending on you today now. I'm denying myself and I'm having daily faith to serve you. You can't store up faith. You say, well, preacher, I'll be honest with you. Right now, my faith is low. I mean, I, I, I'm being hit. You might be one of those families. You might be one of those families that when you thought that life could not get any worse, and it did. God's still there. He's still there. He hasn't changed. He hasn't left you. He will not cast you out. She obeyed God's promise. She received God's provision with daily faith, denying herself, putting God first. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, verse 17, it did. And it came to pass, verse 17, after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Remember, he is all she had. Verse 18, and she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? What did I do to you? I mean, I did exactly what you said. Why? What have I to do with thee? O thou man of God, art thou coming to me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Isn't that what Satan want to, wants to perch on our shoulders and say, Ah, see, you've gotten what you deserved because you did this and you did that when you were younger and, and you did this last week and you're, you're, you, 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 everybody thinks that you're some great Christian at church and, and, but you don't measure up and see, you're getting what you deserve. Well, first of all, let me, let me just point out some things. A lot of my problems I cause, Okay? A lot of my problems come from my uh, uh, lack of, of determination, dedication, my, my lack of discipline on my tongue. A lot of things that come my way, I own those things, okay? And I know when those things come back at me and blow back in my face. I understand that. Then there are some other things that just come out of nowhere in my life, and I'm sure in yours as well. Understand that those have to have a permission slip from Almighty God. And she was worried that it was because of her sin coming back on her. That God is remembering that, that sin. Hebrews 10, 17 is a, is a wonderful verse. The Bible says, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now Satan remembers our sin. Oh, he does. He loves to remind us of our sin. 
And we need to make our sin right with God and to restore fellowship with Him. In 1 John 1, 9, we need to confess that and name it as sin, repent from it as sin. But as far as God judging and remembering and storing up and finding ways to to make our life miserable, no, 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 no. That's not our God. That's not our God. Well, then how do you explain? Here's a lady that, that, that showed great faith, daily faith, and God's providing. And yet her son falls sick and dies. When things couldn't get any worse, it did. But God's still there. Read on with me, please, in verse 19. He said unto her, Give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom and carried him into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, thou hast, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow which whom, with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Even God's man had questions. It's okay to bring your question to God. It's all right. Go ahead. He's a big God. He can take it. Bring your questions to God. He already knows your heart. He already knows what we're thinking. Why not go ahead and and say, God, why are you doing this? What are you doing? I don't understand. Help me. Remember the one that came to Jesus? When Jesus said, dost thou believe? He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. So if your faith is wavering, if your gas tank of faith is low, come to God and say, Lord, I need faith. And where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Get into his word. Listen for his voice. Let him charge up your faith. See what God has done in the past. Check his track record. And then oftentimes we'll come back to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I've charged you foolishly. I know you're in tomorrow. And I know you're here with me today. I'm going to trust you. Now, she didn't know all this. Elijah was still learning this. He said, God, why? Let's read on, please. Verse 21. Elijah stretched himself upon the child three times. Interesting, three times. What does that remind you of? That reminds me of the resurrection. Three days our Lord was in the tomb. Three days. It's not coincidence. Reminds us that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Stretched himself upon the boy three three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and, and and, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house, delivered him into his mother, and Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. See, looky here. Praise God. God's still there. In the midst of, in, in, when, when the brook dried up, when the bear was depleted, when the boy was dead, in the midst of all of that, God was still there. God got glory to his name. Verse 24 says, And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. She saw God's power. Now, we want to see God's power at the beginning. But she gave her faith and obedience before the power of God was seen. That pleases the Lord. When we step out on faith and say, Lord, I'm on your side. I trust you by faith. Your credit is good with me. I'm just a human being. I'm an empty barrel. I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing, I'm I'm nothing in your eyes. But Lord, I need you. I need you to fill my life. I need you to give me purpose. I need to to bring peace to my my troubled life. Here's here's an interesting thing, guidance. Guidance means I can count on God. When you have guidance from the Lord, that you can count on God. But commitment means that God can count on you. That's what she did. She committed her life to God. And after she did that, 
what happened? Life got worse, not better. So that God could show his mightiest power. Yeah, that's one thing. Of, uh, someone might say, well, that's a, some magic trick. Somehow, some way, put, put meal back in, cornmeal back in the barrel every day. Every, yeah. But what we're talking about here is raising a boy from the dead. His mightiest power he showed in someone who expressed faith in God. When you express faith in God, when you step out and say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. Lord, I'm going to give my talent to you. I'm not going to hide it and hoard it. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to obey you in, in, in what you've said to do in my life. When that happens, God's going to say, hey, look at so-and-so. Hey, Satan, look at my servant. Like he said, look at my servant, Job. They're serving me. They don't know where tomorrow is going to come from. They don't have everything all worked out. Could you just imagine Satan saying, well, you let me take that boy away from her and she'll curse you to your face. She'll quit on you. She'll throw in the towel. I said, all right, all right. Go ahead. You can take the boy. I wonder what God has allowed to be taken out of your life. Understand that God can give it back with greater blessings than you could ever imagine. And... For your good, bring glory to his name. So as, we, as we've gathered here for this purpose here today, I don't know what's going on in your life, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Our life is but a vapor. It appeared for a little time and then vanishes away. There ought to be some people here that would say, Lord, I believe you're still there, even, even though the, the brook dries up. Even though the, the barrel is depleted, even though the body is dead, I'm trusting you. She obeyed God's promise, she received God's provision, and she believed God's power. You say, well, what do I need to do about that, preacher? There needs to be many of us that will come to God and say, Lord, first of all, forgive me for blaming you. Forgive me for charging you foolishly. I should have trusted you, and I still don't know the answers, but I'm going to confess to you that I believe your will and your best is for my life. Secondly, and Lord, in the midst of this, I'm going to ask for your peace in the midst of the storm. So I'm, by faith, I'm saying, Lord, I let you off the hook. I don't know why you're doing this. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. I don't know what tomorrow will hold. But I am holding on to you because you hold tomorrow. And Lord, in the midst of all this, give me peace. In the midst of the storm. There ought to be many who would say, boy, what, just when I thought that life couldn't get any worse, it did. But I'm holding on to the anchor that God's still there. It may be a parental situation that you're dealing with. It may be something with your job. It may be something financially, something physical. It might be a spiritual need. I don't know. But to each and every one of you, I remind you, God's still there. Let's bow our heads, please. There is one place that God's not going to be. In the eternal lake of fire, I cannot tell you that God's still there. If you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there will come a time that you will bow the knee and proclaim him as Lord, and then you'll be flung in headlong into the lake of fire that burneth with fire and brimstone forever and ever and ever, and God will not be there. You'll be eternally separated from him. Today, the gift of salvation is offered to you. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you run to him today. You come to him Say, I don't know for sure that heaven's my home, but I need to know that I'm saved. And for the family of God here today, let me remind you that God's still there. In the midst of your suffering, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of adversity, the mountains that are crushing in on your life, He loves you. He cares about you. 
And he's able to work the miracle that you need in your life. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let's stand to our feet with no one looking around. As the music plays, Lord Jesus, I've delivered the message that you've laid upon my heart. This is not my message. This is your message. And I don't know. It could be just for one person. It could be for a multitude. Lord, I plead with you now. Help us to respond rightly to adversity and trial in our life. We had the example of Elijah. We had the example of the widow woman. And they did not have Romans 8, 28. They did not have the New Testament. They did not have the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, help us to run to you. Lord, to bow the knee. To not charge you foolishly. To ask for your forgiveness and our blame. And to ask for your peace. And have faith in the darkness. Please, God. May victories be won right this moment in the hearts of believers, we pray in Jesus' name. As Brother Lyle sings the invitation song, I'm not going to ask you to sing. I'm going to ask you to respond if God is calling you, if he's asking you to come and to bow the knee. Then do exactly what, what we've said here, what I've told you. Perhaps confess to God, I'm sorry for blaming you. Lord, I'm, I'm, I ask for your peace and I ask for your courage to have faith in the dark days because I believe you're still there. As he sings, would you obey God? As, as he calls you to come, would you come? If this is the church where God wants you to be, come and join. All to Jesus I surrender. If you've not followed the Lord and believer's baptism, please obey him. Obey him. All to him I freely give. God still moves. God still moves. I surrender all. Amen. Amen. You know we have to humble ourselves, men, or God will humble us. God can do that. Don't make him do that. Sing the next verse. Oh, to Jesus. For the gym. Surrender for the gym. This world needs leaders, men of God, who will square their shoulders back and say, Lord, I trust you. I can believe in you. I'll lead my family accordingly. And God will bless you. God will provide for you. Say, God can't do anything about my need. <laughs> you don't have a big enough image of God, do you? We've seen him do the miraculous. Others have come. Sing one more verse, would you? All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. surrender all. God bless you. There are folks still being dealt with. You may be seated. Thank you so very much.